Hey, LA Progressive Readers, friends, family. Dick and I are delighted to be sitting down again with Peter Larman, who is a retired minister, um, who is a member of the National Board of Elders. Did I Council get of right? Elders, National Council of Elders. Yes. National Council of Elders. He graciously contributes his wonderful writings to the LA Progressive on a regular basis and has been doing that. Gosh, I think for about 10 years. So, Peter, thank you for joining us again. And thank you for sharing your pearls of wisdom. And it, and really, his writings are just that. And we're going to be talking today about a piece that he wrote that is called The Work of Reconstruction is Forever. Exactly. And thank you, Sharon and Dick. Uh, it does give me tremendous pleasure. And it stimulates me to be in, in uh, engaged with you in this uh, really important stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, I want to talk about really the gist of this article and how it really syncs up very nicely with the LA Progressive. So this morning I woke up and I was thinking, I, I listened to a lot of left-leaning um, podcasts and some of the content is more radical than what the LA Progressive publishes. It's not that the LA Progressive does not agree with those radical positions, but I kind of like to present content to people who are sort of on a journey to try to understand where they need to be. And that's what I like about this article because the article talks about the need to do more than just vote. I mean, we want, we want to create a civil society and you give us some ideas on, on why it is that we need to do more than just uh, get Biden reelected. Right. Uh, it's a both end proposition, isn't it? I mean, we need to uh, vote, but organize behind that and understand that in a weakened democracy, uh, the act of voting is is weakened. For example, um, I was saying to, uh, to Dick before we went live, a lot of my friends, highly educated uh, white liberals, uh, have been telling me how relieved they are that uh, the president didn't fall off the podium that you know there were no major mess ups in the state of the union and they're like okay i guess we're going to be good and i'm like whoa whoa <laughs> how blasé how blasé and how naive is that because let us suppose and you know from from our lips to god's ears let us suppose that uh biden um uh, has the electoral votes that's the that's the I formula something with this the other other people have said very clearly that I'll call them the you know the fascist element the the MAGA detached from reality whatever you want to call them they've said very clearly they won't accept it um, and so the electoral side of this needs to be kind of overwhelming it needs to be a tidal wave uh, uh, that that work is actually essential and then I think we need to prepare ourselves for sustained. Uh, resistance, or, 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 organizing forward. Interestingly, some of the people in the Council of Elders who are civil rights heroes of mine, who risked their lives in Mississippi and elsewhere during the Jim Crow era, uh, say, well, we, we're we familiar with fascism. We're, we're familiar with totalitarian situations where uh, regular remedies don't apply, and yet we organized and 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 uh, won some stuff. I just think we need to uh, brace ourselves, which which is different from bracing ourselves is very different from getting um, hysterical. That's not helpful. But 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 thinking through what this what this is going to look like because it's going to be more than ugly at every at every step. Um, and we need to think about when we say when we talk about voting in a weakened democratic system, we also have to think really hard about the down ballot races everywhere across the country. So yeah, I you're right. I'm I'm trying to suggest that our problem is uh as you say, uh disconnection to the reality of of what we're facing and also a tendency not to do what you do so well, Sharon, which is try to bridge the gaps in understanding with people who aren't quite where we uh, are. I'm I'm always open, 
always open and eager, in fact, to talk to people who are maybe a little bit detached from reality. That's okay with me. That's I think that's our job. So yeah, so on on the thing of of of, of Democrats doing cartwheels over over Joe Biden's performance, I think it was that uh, a lot of the Democratic insiders, the talking heads, uh, have been pumping him up and saying he's doing just fine, uh, knowing that that's not really true. That he is really, you know, he's really an eighty-one-year-old man who acts that way, and the fact that he didn't stumble over himself. Uh, gave them hope that he would be okay. You, you do talk about there's a need for a third reconstruction. Could you touch basically on what the first two were and how the third one would have to be different to succeed? Yes, and, and I should give uh, credit where credit is due. The idea of third reconstruction was articulated most powerfully by Reverend Barber and the, the Poor People's Campaign, but the first reconstruction uh, was uh, the very clear effort by the Union, which barely survived the bloody Civil War, 700,000 people killed in battle, not to mention others killed of disease and and uh, uh, imprisonment. Um, the uh, Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and, and 15th, first basically said Black people are human beings and full citizens with full voting rights, uh, 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 you know, and and had inalienable rights going forward. Uh, the probably the most important. Uh, it's actually a second revolution, if you think about it, in relation to the revolution of uh, the 18th century. Uh, that was, as you know, completely gutted and abandoned by people in the North. Uh, 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 accommodating themselves to the su to the Southern whites in this period of so-called reconciliation, which which gave rise to a new suppression and a new uh, uh, well Jim Crow. So a, a new both disenfranchisement and every conceivable form of exclusion and cruelty and oppression, and that lasted. If you if we let's say we date it from eighteen. 80 roughly it was created by white terrorism relevant to our time um and the complicity of let's just say northern liberals you know who really wanted to get back to business i mean the business of the country was uh the gilded age right the business of the country was railroads mining uh ran, you know robust manufacturing and they wanted access to southern and western resources so uh let's just for, let's shake hands you know, and forget about all this, all this ill, ill feeling, <laughs> 700,000 people dead, and go forward. Uh, horrendous. And of course, there were, there were inspiring uh, black voices in strong resistance to this. I mentioned some of them when I mentioned Ida B. Wells, Barnett working against uh, lynching, obviously Du Bois, Douglas, who lived to a very uh, long age and, and uh, always kept clarity about this. But then, you know, fast forward in my lifetime, and I think in your lifetimes as well, Jim Crow was, was still a reality, right? Uh, meaning uh, separate accommodation, separate schools, uh, widespread disenfranchisement, widespread uh, uh, travel restrictions, uh, uh, horrendous controls on every aspect of African-American life. It was the modern civil rights movement that that we call the second reconstruction, right? The, the battle for for the battle to achieve the 1964 1965 legislation, and all that that entailed, complete with the enforcement um, enfor enforcement mechanisms. Now, we're at the point where that is under threat by by a, a political orientation which is white supremacist in nature. I think that's its origin story. White supremacists in nature, they're pretty explicit about that. Um, you know, the replacement theory, all that stuff. Um, and they're determined that they understand that people of color voting deprive, deprive them of control and deprive corporate state of absolute control. So underneath what we face this year is the fact that we need, we, we absolutely need a third reconstruction 
which is thoroughgoing, so that we dismantle the obvious aspects of racial capitalism that are going to continue to destroy us, both in the civic space, in the environmental space, in the uh, gender space. Um, we can't, it's not good enough. It's just simply not good enough to, although it's essential, it's not good enough to uh, hold back the full flood, the immediate vengeance campaign of Donald J. Trump. Uh, we need to do much more than that because half the states have been taken over by these people already. And I, I, I no longer hesitate to use the word fascist. If you actually look at what they're doing, it's the fascist model. That's right. Fascism's fascism's installation depends on you know widespread disinformation, confusion uh, in the media, and finally passivity on the part of people who say, "Hey, I can't fight this," and that's already happening in many parts of the country. So I'd <clears throat> I'd like to put forward that the the first and second reconstructions failed in that there was an there was not an educational component. Because what we're seeing now, this um, overwhelming, what I feel, overwhelming support for Donald J. Trump is a demonstration of people who are ill-informed and undereducated. And I believe that had the first and second reconstruction included strong components of education about why it is that this nation is strong because of diversity. What, you know, it's, it's not just simply a statement. You can do a complete analysis as to why that is. Why does diversity make organizations strong? There are people that have done their, you know, PhD theses on that topic. The average person doesn't understand why and why it is when you oppress one group, that oppression spreads like a cancer and ultimately affects everyone else. My, you're talking about, um, us experiencing this in our lifetime, Jim Crow. I remember the first time that I went to Disneyland and I was a child living in New York City, visiting California for the, visiting Southern California where my grandparents had recently moved in 1965. And I was seven years old and I was afraid to go to Disneyland because we were going to Southern California <laughs> and I didn't know if they were going to stop us at the door and not allow us um, entry into Disneyland, which, of course, I was wrong. And they did allow us entry, but we were not treated very nicely there. So it was a white space. That was a white that, space. It was started as a white space, of course. Mm -hmm. Well, all of Southern California was mapped out as a white space. We know that from history. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So it's just, uh, I'm just saying that the sentiments that drive these forces um, haven't changed. Those sentiments really haven't changed. Both the sentiments of the overt, nasty um, white supremacists and those who tacitly support the white supremacists just by simply remaining quiet. I don't think that's really changed much. Well, Sharon, I, I want to push back just a little bit on uh, your argument that first and second lacked an educational dimension only in this respect. The African-American voices in both cases were very clear in terms of connecting the dots and uh, uh, making it clear what's at stake, that the actual living, let's call it the living spirit of American democracy was in play was was at stake in 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 suppression and in the culture of violence uh certainly Du Bois was unbelievably clear about that uh, uh and and King and Malcolm and others in in the in the second reconstruction likewise the problem was penetration right the problem was not enough white people being willing to say that's right this thing is broken at a fundamental level you know uh when King when King said uh, in 1967, in that famous speech, uh, America is the greatest purveyor of violence the world, uh, the world has known, uh, and tied together imperialist war abroad, repression at home, uh, capitalism run amok, 
he was educating everybody and he was left to do a twist in the wind, so to speak, by a huge part of the left at that time, not to mention the Democratic establishment. I mean, that's when that's when uh, Johnson, the Johnson administration went completely berserk. And, and you know, I think I think withdrew protection from King so that he was assassinated a year later. Mm -hmm. It's true that they monitored him, but they also protected him. Uh, and that protection was withdrawn. Wow. Um, wow. So uh, the problem, as always, is the white people. Oh, yes. You know, I mean, to understand uh, whiteness as a, and white supremacy as a form of, you know, mental and spiritual disorder is, is, is really the challenge. And unless we, unless we work at that, unless we work at that, and again, bringing people along, Churches, churches are a great space for that, by the way, because mm -hmm. churches have a lot of people who are moderate, and then they have people like you and me, and but we're in fellowship together, right? So uh, respectful speaking, listening, teaching can happen in those spaces, but all those spaces, the union, trade union spaces need to be, the professional associations, all of that uh, needs to be activated in this uh, conversation. You're absolutely right. It's it's segmented now. So you have, I mean, I've got over here this all red copy of the Atlantic magazine, What Will Happen If Trump Gets Back In. Um, how many people read Atlantic? You know, um, how many people will read the the Michelle Alexander speech? We were the beautiful new speech of hers that we were referencing earlier. A, a tiny, tiny number. And then, of course, and you're media people, so you know this, there's this unbelievable media racket. Um, uh, so if it, if we're not reaching people, how to put this more organically, uh, we're not going to reach them yeah. probably. So I have a question about that. I mean, people like the three of us and many people we've worked with over the years agree that just simply beating off, off the Trump advance <laughs> is, is not nearly good enough that there needs to be a thoroughgoing change economically socially uh, to address uh, racism, really, in a way that the first two reconstructions didn't succeed in doing. You, you say, for one thing, that churches are oftentimes a way to bring that message, but also some churches we read about and see are, are engines of division uh, in the South, where they, they, preach, they preach white supremacy. But but one thing, so I wonder what where our audience is for changing the the opinion of a broad swath of white people, and I raise that because Sharon and I attend a a a, a, a seminar by a friend of ours, uh, Professor Jody Armour, and I've always been of the opinion that uh, if if uh, if poverty were dealt with, racism would go away. That the reason that poor white people are also racist and, and look at their and think at the economy has gone to hell, even when the numbers say the economy is pretty good, is, is because of poverty. Well, Jody's research shows that it's kind of the reverse, that, that there's a certain segment of people that are deeply racist. And... And so they they blame they so they think then the economy is bad because of black people, and I think that's you, you know in our day and age over the course of our lives maybe the condition of a broad swath of black people hasn't improved significantly. That's oftentimes Sharon's point, but the 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 black faces in high places are certainly proliferated in a way that when you and I Peter were young. Uh, and and I, I'm sure the people that are intuitively racist uh, see that and react to it. Football, sports, uh, the the Congress, uh, a recent president. So how do you think we go about reaching people who uh, these poor white people? How how do we do it? Well, that's been. Um a dilemma for a hundred years uh, and more. And you say it well, uh, Dick, and your your uh, your academic colleague says it well. Um, another way to think of this is that um, the way white supremacy and uh, slavery were set up and were the defining characteristics of this uh, economy for a couple of hundred years, 
the default wage in, in the U.S. context is zero. Do you follow me? Um, and uh, in the South in particular, but really everywhere, uh, uh, employers have been able to divide people and, uh, and uh, political bad actors have been able to divide people to uh, to uh, degrade wages and uh, working conditions. We have weak labor laws in part because uh, significant parts of the workforce were excluded from the labor law, law, law because they were dominated by people of color, uh, care workers, uh, uh, ca you know, casual laborers and so forth, not, not in, included. Um, how we go about this, I actually think that people are, are now ready. There is so much, uh, I've been reading about this in the last few days, there is so much credit card debt. So the economy yet again is floating on high interest rates. People really can't afford to maintain their, the, the, the you know, standard that they aspire to without resorting to uh, credit. Um, and I think that, that, I think that, um, because there are many more people of color in the workforce now, uh, unions certainly are making this appeal. We've got to do this uh, together. Uh, uh, I find it fascinating that in the deepest part of the Deep South, you know, my former employer, the United Auto Workers, is has targeted three major plants: one in Chattanooga, Tennessee, going to go back to the big Nissan facility in Mississippi. Um, I can't remember the third one, but they, they. Um, the, the white workers in those plants who were recruited in the South for having anti-union attitudes, I mean, they've got a really good filtering system to 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 because uh, those are good jobs, you know, to fill those uh, those uh, jobs. The white people are more than happy to let black people lead these drives with the understanding that if this isn't a, a you know a biracial and really it's more black and white than Latino in these plants. If, if it's not done that way, it's not going to happen at all. Um, so I don't think I don't think it's uh, hopeless. I mean, Cornell West, um, uh, I can't say this. I don't want to say it, but he uses the N word. He he says when the white people understand they've been enterized, uh, they'll wake up. Well, some white people are waking up. Um, yes. I don't think I don't think it's hopeless, but you're absolutely right to say that 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 racism explains savage inequality in the U.S. economy. It explains why we don't have adequate health care. It explains a lot of things right. about what's broken. Right. So right. we got to fix. We, we, if we don't get that done, if we don't get that fixed, you know, and I remember when uh, Obama was president, he kind of I mean, I was in love with Obama, a lot of people were, but he kind of papered this over with grandiose rhetoric, like, oh, it's 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 okay. Basically, he kind of added to the myth that if you have black faces in high places, right. you're good. And um, no, we're not good, because it, A, breeds resentment, and it does leave behind the mass of people who are never going to be on TV or hold uh, mm -hmm. endowed professorships or any of that. So of the three of us sitting here, I'm the one who can call out the N-word that Cornell West uses. And what he talks about is the niggerization of America. That's the and word. If we focus on the centrality of race, how race was used from the beginning, even during the colonial period, before the United States became the United States, racism was a tool for uh, dividing. It was a divide and conquer technique that soon thereafter became a core component of American culture. But initially it was established to divide the labor classes so that they couldn't come up and rise up against the elites that were at that time um, ruling through the, the in the colonies. Well, Peter, You're once so right. again- so, yeah. so, so, so going forward, you know, if we could, this is an overused word, but intersectionality. If we could, if if people could rise to the occasion, rise to the the current crisis, to use the language of the middle of the nineteenth century, uh, and people who are working on the gender and uh, gender identification fronts could understand um, 
how their struggle relates to the core economic justice struggle and both of those groups understand how the corporate state is also going to kill us through the environmental thing. Those common understandings, uh, and that that's really interesting because even in a local church, I'll go back to that for a minute, you'd be surprised. Church I go to has a it has a green team. The green team doesn't really talk much to the racial justice team, right? Uh, or to the LGBTQ uh, yeah. caucus. They're all doing their own thing. And I'm there like saying, oh, wait a minute, we actually, if we got together in a justice league, we could have some impact out right down here at the state house, uh, but we don't. Yeah, yeah. But I'm working on it. Yes, and I know you are. I know you are, and I know you to be a very effective communicator. So we appreciate the work you do. We appreciate the contributions that you make to the LA Progressive. And um, we hope that people that are listening to us today will share this. That's the only way. We don't have the bandwidth, <clears throat> the money that the right has, but we do have people that believe what we believe, and they should share this content. Yeah, uh, I, I uh, in, in in everything I do now, uh, uh, and I, you know, I'm limited in what I can do, but I can do the local church stuff. I could do the webinar series with my friends in the Council of Elders my own writing. Um, uh, I work with a little uh, foundation that's, that concerns uh, religion and public policy. In all of those contexts, I'm, the message is the same, uh, which is uh, take this a little bit more seriously. Understand, don't, don't treat it lightly. I'll quote Jeremiah, you know, you do not treat the wound of my people lightly. Um, because, uh, because if we don't, uh, take it seriously, which does not mean that there's no joy in the struggle. There is joy in the struggle. In fact, it's incredibly energizing to be, you know, kind of on the ground with people who are in the same space, you know, um, working on these same uh, challenges. Absolutely. Well, we, think... we wouldn't be friends otherwise. You know, we, we have a great friendship and ha had it not been for your activism and our activism, we probably would have never crossed paths. That's and I think that's I find that true of almost everybody who continues to be in my life at, at this advanced age. There are people I've met in the course of struggle on one way or another. So yeah. So this has been wonderful. We can't wait till you write another article and we can do it again. But I wanted to say to Sharon that 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 phrase centrality of race we should use that for LA Progressive. We do use it for LA Progressive. <laughs> See you next time, Peter. You got that eye roll, did you, Dick? Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.